our next speaker um, is also a, a past colleague um, when I used to work at Franklinville, and that is uh, Don Watkins. He's the tech coordinator at Franklinville. Don, you want to come up? <laughs> I'm Don Watkins. Am I supposed to say that? <laughs> well, when Tim first asked me to, I am the tech coordinator, and Lori used to work at Franklin, though I'm really employed there. The, uh, it's supposed to be a joke. The, uh, <laughs> I always tell people to seek employment. Work doesn't pay, but employment does. The, uh, I'm supposed to talk about what the world needs now, and Tim asked me to talk on June 9th. I was, uh, I've been interning, interning, is that the right word? Uh, at Ellicottville, at the BOCES, as a summer school principal. And uh, I was there for one of the staff development meetings and he said, uh, would you be willing to give a talk about what the world needs now? And I kind of foolishly accepted. And so, uh, I shouldn't say that, it's a really great honor to be asked, and I appreciate that very much. But in the time between June 9th and today, I've had about 150 different versions of what you're going to hear, and even what I have now is probably not exactly what you're going to hear. And I got to thinking about it. You know, uh, I, I um, you know, when, what is now? A, a good friend of mine said to me, you know, if you could talk to the greater power, higher power, whatever, what time do you think he'd say it was? And I, when I was younger, I used to try to come up with some profound thought. And the guy said to me, it's now. You know, we talk about the future, we talk about the past, and I thought about this a lot. Right now is now. We don't have five minutes from now, and we can't, we, unlike a VCR and a DVD, we can't wind back. It's now. So what we do, is now. And I thought about, too, a lot, what we, really, what we really want to do in schools is we want order. I mean, I talk about creativity, and I like creativity, and I like collaboration when it's in your classroom. But <laughs> when it's in my classroom, I want people to sit in neat rows, and I want them to pay attention. Last year, I was actually headed out the door. I was going to retire. I didn't tell anybody. I, I had my retirement notarized, and by the end of the day, Tom Kopp grabbed me, and I was doing my best to avoid him, and I've told him this story already, but the, uh, he said, I want you to think about teaching a class uh, about what is now evolved into something called digital citizenship. And so he brought me back in, and again, that was not something that I was planning. That was not something that happened now. And so I, I, I just wanted to preface what I'm going to say by those particular things. Uh, what I just said to you now, none of it I wrote in the last 100, this is the 151st version. Oh, and my Amazon Kindle just turned off, so I hope I can bring that back. Ah, there it is. So the thing that I really wanted, that one of my favorite quotes is from a guy named Rumi. I don't know how many people here have ever heard of Rumi, but Rumi was a guy who lived around the time of St. Francis of Assisi, and it's interesting that he really lives in what today is called Iran or Afghanistan. He was a Persian. And Rumi, the quote that really resonated for me when I read it was, sell your cleverness, purchase bewilderment. And I thought, how antithetical. That really creates, people call it cognitive dissonance, and there's other words for it. But I, when I read that, I thought, my God, is that what we really want? And the more, I, the more I think about it, and the more other books I read, and, the other, and I look back on my own life, how important that really is. In schools, mostly we prize cleverness, because it's neat, and it's orderly, and you can be measured. But really, maybe what we ought to think about is selling that and purchasing bewilderment, which is also called collaboration and cooperation and all the other things that I wish were in your class but not in mine. So, uh, 
Why would anybody really want to abandon uncertainty or abandon certainty for uncertainty? But it's really the tension between those two that really invites creativity. And that, I think, is part of what we need now, is that we need to sell some of the cleverness. And I really liked what Rich Ognabine, I never heard him before this morning, but I had tears in my eyes. He was awesome. Because I really believe a lot of what he said and what Bonnie just said. Because we really do need love. The people that we talk to, the people that we work with every day, these children come from unbelievable places. Unbelievable places. I have to hit the Kindle, hopefully hit it once and not twice. So 20 students sitting in a row, sitting in rows or sitting in class, or maybe if you have 25, whatever, folded their hands, listening and all that, does that really invite creativity? Is that really what we're looking for? Do we really serve today's learners by asking them to sit quietly and stay on task? And I know that was something for me. I'm teaching this class on digital citizenship. I got everything put together in Moodle. I got kids blogging two positive things about themselves every day. And people say, oh, that's cool. That's what you're doing. But you know, when somebody in the back of the class starts, or not in the back of the class, the side of the class, wherever they are, starts talking, and they're not paying attention to the big shot here, I get upset. And I have to step back and realize that today's learners are a lot different than I was, or that I am. They truly can, not all of them maybe, but a lot of them can truly multitask. And I say, when I say to them, do you know what I just said? They, they repeat verbatim what I just said. So I thought, oh, okay, I have to, I have to take a step back. <laughs> and so, you know, maybe some of the lowest levels of learning really do occur at the lowest levels of Bloom's taxonomy you know, like knowledge and comprehension and things like that. But if I think about my own learning, the, you know, and I, I've had this proven to me just recently a number of times, I think about my own learning, the things that really, when all of a sudden things click, when you get to the upper levels of blooms, it's insight. And it's not always when I'm extremely focused some people say, like our superintendent and Cindy and other people like that, have said to me, don't you ever go to bed because they get an email from me at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's when it clicked. All of a sudden I wake up or whatever and I go, oh my God, that's it. And so I, I have to do what I have to do at that particular time because I'll lose it. Because if I try to, if I try to get some order, I lose that stuff. So, I guess my invitation is to think about being a little bit disorderly. And again, this is the 152nd version. Um, one of my favorite books that I've read in the last 10 years is called The Tao of Pooh. And if you haven't read that, I encourage you to read it. It's written by Benjamin Hoff, I think the guy's name is. And the Chinese have something called the Wu Wei, which he calls the Pooh Wei. And I really think that that's really valuable. It's about the uncarved block. Again, it goes back to the, the cleverness business. The, unclar the uncarved block is about being yourself. And that's not just being yourself with your peers. That's being yourself with your students, too. That's something that I try to bring into the classroom, is I try to talk to the kids about me and part of like what I really again that's something that really resonated for me with what Rich said this morning in the Moodle class I have a picture of me in 1965 or 66 and yes they did have color photography back then and they uh, and I say to the kids I said who is that and some of them that are a little bit more perceptive can see they can look past the gray hair and the glasses and all that stuff and they say that's you. And I said, yeah, that's right, that's, that's me, when I was your age. And I said, do you think I liked myself then? And of course, they don't know what to say. And the truth of the matter is, I didn't. I felt really uncomfortable. And so I try to tell them that. I try to get that across to them, OK? And I think that's important. I also, you know, like I'm supposed to teach people about not to send text messages when you're driving, and not to do things like that, not to be a distracted driver. And, you know, 
I also tell them about the time I hit a deer eating a pizza in my car. Now, you're not supposed to do that. The kids found that very funny. I couldn't get them to stop laughing. But I think that's the kind of transparency that you need. You need to be able, they need to be able to see that you were a child like them and that you are, can still be, and that openness creates an openness in them which is necessary for learning to occur. They said that a, a, a mind is like a parachute. It only really works when it's open. And I think that's really important. So that's something else I think that the world needs now. I came up with a little acronym for it. It's H-O-W, honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. And if you think about openness, another thing, a way to think about it too, I really like, is and this comes from the Tao Te Ching. We shape clay into a pot, but it is the emptiness inside that holds whatever we want. We work with being, but it's really non-being that we use. And I had to think about that for a long time. And that's like the sound of one hand clapping. Ooh, what do you mean by that? But we need to create a sense of openness, whatever that is. And you know what's best for your particular classroom or your particular setting. If you're an administrator, you know what you need to do to create that sense of openness. And our students need, and this goes back to something that Bonnie said, I really like. Our students have needs, and many of them need to know that we love them. You need to literally say that to them. I literally said that to them. I said, I love you. And most people are very uncomfortable with that. I was, for much of my life, I lost some really good friends who died of cancer and other things, and I never told them that I loved them. And I regretted that. Today, I try to tell people that I love them and let them know that. And that's really important with these kids because so many of them have, are not loved. They didn't ask to be born. They're here and then they really need that from us. And we need to accept them as they are, not as we would have them be. At summer school this year, they made the decision to let the kids wear hats. Am I running out of time? Oh my God, I can't believe I talked that long. They, uh, um, Mark was right. So we need, we let them wear hats. We even let them use cell phones. Now they can't use cell phones in class. The teachers, they don't allow them to use cell phones, but in the halls, just imagine a school where you didn't take issue with cell phones and hats. Uh, and somehow learning is occurring. Of course, we'll see it at the end of the summer school if how the grades turn out, but we're hopeful. So we need to be, we need, to, and our, our acceptance of them needs to be unconditional as best we can. And maybe that comes with unconditionally accepting ourselves as we are as well. I'm further along in my talk. You need, to, you need to tell the kids your story, and I, maybe I'm being a little bit redundant here. You need to share your vision of what they could be. And I, I came from a really non-traditional background. I believe it or not, I started out, went to college at Oswego State. Richard Nixon sent me an invitation to the Vietnam War, and I wound up going. And, and I didn't go to Vietnam. I don't want to be like that congressman right recently who got in trouble. I, I was all stateside. I was a hospital corpsman. I worked in a naval hospital and helped deliver babies. And, you know, and then I kind of did some wandering, and then I wound up at Franklinville, and I worked there as a custodian for a long time, or about eight years, and then I got married and met a lovely lady, and, and she and some other teachers at Franklinville encouraged me to go back to school. So I'm really non-traditional. I didn't get my bachelor's degree until I was 35. You need to talk to people about that because there's lots of other people, there's lots of students who think that if they don't follow the path that everyone else is on, that somehow they're a failure and they need to see that that's not always the case. And the other thing is about being open is I thought about this too. What prior experience prepared me for where I am today? I wanted to be a history teacher. I went to college when I, before Mr. Nixon sent me the invitation to be an anthropologist. People say to me, you're a geek. No, I'm not a geek. I'm actually have a history, I'm a history major. I have a BS in history. I can teach American history. 
And sometimes I tell people that I will start teaching when I stop making history, I will start teaching it. But so you need to be open, you need to be willing. And I think that's really what I think that's really what the world needs now. We live in a really unsettled time, lots of things that are very confusing and lots of lots of things are being turned upside down. But we need to be open. I think we really need to be open and to embrace the change, embrace the people that come our way, the students that come our way, and even the, our coworkers at time, you know, they need that help. Um, you know, I thought another thing too, you know, I, I tell the kids in my class, my old man had a Kodak movie camera, 50 foot film, and it took two weeks to get it developed. You have students that come into your class that have Blackberries and droids on their hips and they got video and they could even take pictures of you without you knowing it and have it on YouTube before the end of the period. So you need to be aware of that. Not to be scared of it, just to be aware of it. You know, things are, things are really changing and I think that's what we need to be open to and it's all bewildering. So um, I guess uh, the one thing I want to say is not to focus on the problem. One of the, I didn't realize until today, which was maybe too late, that I could show you a video, but one of my favorite clips is from Patch Adams where he has Patch look at his four fingers and he says, how many do you see? And he says, four. And he says, no, no, look beyond, look beyond. And I think that's what I really want to encourage you is to look beyond, not, not just to look and see what's right in front of you because it's in looking beyond that often we see the, the solution for our problems. So uh, I just want to say I don't really know what the answer is other than I think it, we need to be open, we need to be honest, we need to be willing, we need to love the people around us and especially the children. That's all I got. You know, I want to thank Don, too, for, for being open to my son. He was one of the, the first people, I think, in Franklinville who really appreciated his humor and, and his idiosyncrasies. So thanks, Don. And your award. Thanks a lot. You get a hug, too. <laughs> okay. Tim, do you want to go 